If there's anything that the church needs right now, we need revival. And I'm not talking about a week-long group of services. I'm not talking about an event where we, you invite your favorite preacher in and we got fish fries and hot chicken plates. No. The church needs a real revival. We need a regeneration of heart and mind. Turning back to God turning back to the things that are important and not the things that we've made important. Over the last two years, we've made a lot of things more important than God. We've made a lot of things more prevalent than church. We've given a whole lot of things priority more than we've given God. But in this season, I believe the Lord is calling us back to a place of revival. He's calling us back to the altar. He's calling us back to his presence because there's some things that can only happen in his presence come on amen somebody there's some things that can only happen in his presence and as much as you like to say that the Lord met me at bedside Baptist there's some things that God will go there's places where God tabernacles and there's places that God dwells so I'm grateful that the Lord is calling us back to the altar. He's calling us back to his tabernacle. He's calling us back to a place of revival. He's calling us back to a place. Okay. He's calling us back to a place of blind obedience. What does that mean? What that means is, God, I don't have to have an explanation as to why you're doing what you're doing. I don't have to have a blueprint. I don't have to have all of the steps. You ain't got to explain to me, God, what it is that you're doing in my life. But I trust you enough that, Father, if you're leading and if you're guiding, Father, that you have purpose in what you're leading and you're guiding me into that, Father, if you're directing me, there's a reason, God, why you're directing me this way. Father, if you're bringing, yeah, even if you're bringing challenges into my life, Father, there's a purpose behind the challenge. Uh-huh. God, you don't try me. You don't test me for no reason. But, Father, there's purpose even in the testing. Even in the pain that I feel in this moment, God, there's purpose even in my pain. Oh, God. There's something, Father, that you're doing even in the midst of my pain. Even in the midst of my suffering, God. Lord, you're working in the midst of it. And because you're in it, God, I got the faith to go through it. <laughs> God, because I know that you're in it. Father, I have the courage to face it. God, because I know that you're in it. I know that I'm not in it by myself. But Father, you're fighting with me and you're fighting for me. So God, I thank you. And I give you praise. God, I thank you and I give you praise. In Jesus' name. Come on, clap your hands and give God praise. Hallelujah. Come on, clap your hands and give God praise. You can have your seats in the presence of the Lord on this morning. Listen, the Lord has already took me halfway through my message in the worship, so we're going to get there real quick. Turn your Bibles real quick. James chapter 1. We do give praise and honor to God for this opportunity to stand. I honor him because he didn't have to choose me to serve, but he did, and I'm grateful for it. I do honor my pastor in his absence in the person of Bishop Randy Borders. Come on, can we thank God for our bishop on this morning? Come on, we can do better than that on this morning. I honor him and I honor Lady Borders. They have been my pastors now for almost 20 years and I'm grateful that God allowed our paths to cross and he allowed us this opportunity to serve. We do give honor to all of the officers and leaders in this great church, all of those that serve in all of your respective places 
on this morning. We're grateful for you and grateful again that you allowed us this opportunity to stand. I'm grateful that uh, Brother David Lucas came and assisted us on this morning. Come on, can we thank God for, for Brother Lucas? Amen. He is definitely a servant indeed, and we thank God for him coming and assisting us on this morning. Hallelujah. Grab your Bibles, James chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, reading from the ESV this morning. I know y'all trying to figure out what the preacher doing, why he turn around reading. Well, you know, things happen. Amen. James chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Uh -huh. And the Bible says that James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in desperation, greetings, count it all joy. Yes, Lord. My brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Verse 4, can we get that one too? Uh-huh. I'm sorry if I ain't tell you. I thought I told you. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, well, well, well. Here we go. And let. Jesus, the pastor can't read. All right. Um, First Peter chapter 1. Can we get First Peter chapter 1? Amen. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. Just those two verses that we'll lift up. Uh-huh. And he says, in this rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We're going to stop right there at those two passages of scripture on this morning. You can grab my phone for me. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to stop there. But I need you to turn to your neighbor this morning and repeat my subject for me this morning. Tell your neighbor, say neighbor. It's all about to make sense. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Turn to your neighbor on the other side. Say, neighbor, I, I, I know you've been a little confused about this season that you're in right now. And you've been asking God to explain to you the nature of what it is that he's trying to do in the middle of all of what he's trying to do. But say, neighbor, say, it's all about to make sense. Yeah. So the reality is simply this. For many of us this morning, we find ourselves in the middle of what James is actually depicting here in the scriptures that we read in James chapter 1 and also the scriptures that we read in 1 Peter chapter 1. In these two particular passages of scripture, James now and Peter are writing letters to the churches that now have been dispersed in different parts of Asia Minor and different parts of the earth at this moment. They are writing letters and they're trying to to give explanation to the church as to why it is that they're being persecuted in the way that they're being persecuted. For the scriptures tell us if we study history that in this moment, uh, the church at large in this moment was being persecuted. The church at large in this moment, many of the saints were being beheaded. Many of the saints were being killed. Many of the saints found themselves in the middle of many trials. They found themselves in the middle of many tests. They found themselves in the middle of a multitude of trying situations. And in the middle of their trying situation, James and Peter write letters to them and say, Hey, I know you're going through, but I need you to get happy about your go through. Well, uh, I need you to get excited about your go through. As a matter of fact, uh, not only are you going through, but you're going to continue to go through. There's some other things that you're about to face. But as these things are coming your way, <coughs> as they're approaching you, as they show up on your doorstep, I need you to begin to get happy. And I need to begin to get you to begin to get excited about your trial. <coughs> now, many of us this morning, Lord, I'm coughing like my bishop this morning. Pray for me. Must be something about standing in this spot, huh? <laughs> Don't cough like this. Got a black towel there, say. Right, Listen, there's some oils you'd be like, "Did you keep that one right?" 
Hallelujah. All right. Let me. Um, James and Peter began to tell them, they said, listen, in the middle of your trial, as, as even as trials are beginning to approach you, I need you to begin to celebrate your trials. So many of us, as we're looking at this text and we're looking at, at, at me preaching to you this morning, you're looking at me probably the same way that those that were hearing this letter that was written to them were looking at those that were reading it. They say, why should we celebrate in the middle of trial? Don't you understand? Well, we're being beheaded out here in these streets. They boiling us and pops of oil out here in these streets and you're telling me that I need to be excited about my trial. Preacher, you don't understand what I've been through. You don't understand what I'm going through. They just showed up and picked up my car. Why is it that I should be excited mm. and giving God Praise, they don't cut off my stimulus check. They don't cut off my extended benefits. They don't done a whole lot of stuff and you telling me that I need to be excited. They don't cut my All of that. Cutting my hours at work. Don't want to give me the raise when I deserve the raise. Don't want to give me the promotion when I deserve the promotion. Children acting a monkey. Spouse don't know how. All of this is going on and you tell me that I should be excited. Uh -huh. what, what the writer was trying to explain to them and what they were trying to show them was simply this. Listen, your trials uh, should be a place that you begin to get excited, uh, but, but you're excited because you understand what testing and what trials are designed and purpose to do. Yeah, when you're going through and you don't understand what trials and testing are, are, are designed to do, then you will get upset and you will get frustrated. But when you understand that trials and testing are an opportunity that God is trying to prove and to validate your preparedness, your readiness for promotion, then you get a different outlook when you consider your trials. Because the reality is, every one of your trials is God or trying to find out, are you ready or can you be trusted? Oh, my God. Yeah, every one of our trials is God trying to figure out, can we be trusted? Can we be trusted with the increase? Can we be trusted with the opportunity? If he gave us the promotion, are we going to take the power and take the authority and say that we did it all by ourselves? Or, or will we take their authority and take the position and then turn around and give all the glory to God? Because the reality is, yeah, you weren't good enough. Uh -huh, I'm going to tell the whole truth on you today. Yeah, you didn't qualify. Uh -huh. But God said, I'm going to still give it to you. Anyway, so God takes us through tests and through trials to prove us or to understand, are we ready for what it is? That he's trying to take us to. Are we ready for the next place that he's trying to perfect us? What he's trying to do, he's trying to perfect and to test and to try and to purify the gift that he placed on the inside of us. Okay, let me help y'all this morning. I'm going to try to make it, make it relevant this morning. For many of you that do not know, uh, by profession, I am... Uh, a technology dude, I'll simplify it that way. Uh, part of what I do or what I used to do and some of my responsibilities, I used to work at the good bank called Wells Fargo. Uh -huh. And part of my job at Wells Fargo, I was responsible for a process where we tested and developed applications that were used to move, manage, and hold and transact customer transactions. We'll boil that all down in a nutshell. We used to build the stuff that moves and makes your money do what it do. Okay. Okay, we used to build those things. And in the process of building those applications, we used to take those things through a rigorous testing process. Uh, in that testing process, we had to iteratively take them through different segments and different tests and different process to prove and to validate whether the systems were ready to handle real customer money. Uh-huh. Yeah, we had to validate whether they were hand able to handle real customer money. So what do we have to do? We had to take them through multiple testing processes. The first thing we had to do is we had to test them in what we call a development environment. The development environment is what we call the sandbox. This is the place where there are little to no distractions, little to no interruptions, little to no interference. This is where we test the real functionality to see if it functions the way that it's supposed to function. We tested it in the dev environment. That's what God does for us. He tests us sometimes in environments where there's little to no distraction to say, are you really going to do what you're supposed to do? This is the place where he tests your integrity. In the development, he wants to know, uh, can I trust you with a dollar? That if I give you a dollar, are you going to give me my dime? In the development, 
little to no distractions. This is the lowest level of development because if we find breakdowns in the dev environment, it's easy to go back and fix it in the dev environment. Why? Because, again, these are character issues. These are low-level principle issues. This is where, okay, now, you just need to spend more time in your word, fast a little bit more, pray a little bit more, get a little bit closer to me, and we can fix some of these character issues, right? right? But it, once we move from the dev environment, though, we generally promote the code into what we call the, the, the sit environment. It's a, it's a situational environment. Yeah, this is where you place in a situation. In a situation, right? And in the situation, we want to see, okay, have you progressed from the dev environment? Has your character been solidified? When you at the bank and they give you your money back when you cash your check and you know your check was only $420, but somehow that teller got some bills stuck together and she done gave you $680. It's a situation. Because the reality is, then we just talk about the fact I'm in the middle of a trial. I'm in the middle of a test. I'm in the middle of my money being small and my bills being tall. And she done messed up and gave me 600 And she done gave me about $245 more than what she's supposed to give me. It's a situation. In the middle of that situational test. Uh, in, in the middle of a situation. Well, you've been married about a good six, nine months. Uh-huh. You, you didn't change your phone number when you got married. That was the first thing. But then you get that message and you're like, oh, wow. Situation. Okay, and we live in a generation where folks don't just text messages no more. They send vivid images. Uh, situation. And in the middle, situational testing. What would you do in the middle of a situation? Huh? You say, oh, yeah. So the Lord test us. In development environments, character, situational testing, do you pass the situational test? And if you do have the grace to get by, because it's going to take grace to get by. <laughs> okay, Y'all sitting there looking like you. All of us don't needed some grace. Your situation might not have been my situation, and my situation won't your situation, but all of us been in. Situational testing. So... Uh-huh, we go through situational testing, and if we don't find any bugs or any issues in the middle of situational testing, then we promote it into an environment that we call prod fix. Production fix environment. What is production fix environment? The production fix environment is as close to real life as we can get without giving the system real customer money and real customer data. This is that level of testing that is right at the brink of breakthrough. This is that level of testing right before you break through and begin to lay hold to that what it is that God has promised. This is the level of testing where God gives you real life Stuff. This is the level where God brings real stuff right in your face. I mean, we breathe in the same air in my face, and you talking crossways to me. Boy, I'm a grown man. What, what is wrong with you? It's right in our face. Oh, it's in the car with you on your way to church. Right? It's in the bed with you when you lay down at night. It's right. It's in your daily environments. It is this daily. At this point, we're running it just to see if it can perform. So we're putting it through a consistent test, adding all kinds of level of stress. We're putting it in the environment just as though those hackers and attackers would be coming at it. We're trying to see that under the most strenuous and immense type of pressure, can I break you? 
or will you function and produce that which you're supposed to function and produce? This is the place for some of us where we are right now today. God has us in the middle of the hottest and the most fiery trial that we've ever faced in our life. God has us in the middle of some of the hardest tests that we've ever had to face in our life. God has us right in the middle of some stuff where we said, God, you could have done anything but do this to me and call and think that I'm still. God, you could have took anything but taken that. But God has us in the middle. Some of the hardest and hottest tests that we find ourselves in. And this is the same thing that the church found themselves in. And James and Peter said, count it all joy. Be happy, be exuberant, be excited about the fact that God has you in the middle of the hottest, in the hottest furnace and the hottest fire that you've ever. Be happy and excited that God has you in the middle of a test where he's refining you, he's purifying you, he's cooking you, and he's boiling off of you. Everything that is unnecessary for the next season of your life. That's what God is doing. But the reality is we're still asking God why. Huh? Come on. Are there any honest people in the room? Yeah, say, yeah. I'm still asking God why. No, I need to understand. See, I talk to God in real language. I know y'all go to God, and you know, you, you go to God with them, them soliloquies and them poems. I go to God with real language, like, hey! That's right. That's right. What's really going on? Yeah. Hey. You know, so they used to sing the song that says, don't push me because I'm close to the edge. Look, uh, I'm so close to the edge. I ain't talking about push. You can breathe on me and it's going to be a... But I'm asking God, why? Huh? Why? Because now I'm, I'm doing everything that I know to do. And it's still... I'm doing over and above what I'm even asked to do. Still, stop side. I'm early, but still, Malachi three and ten. I honored you with tithes and offering, but still, God, why? So let's go back to the text. He says, when you go back to the text, he said, this is why. He says, because testing uh, your faith, oh, whoo, your test, test aspects is going to work. Patience. And what it's going to do, it's going to purify. Uh -huh, that It's going to purify. You're going to go to the next verse. Uh -huh, help me. Help me. Go to the next verse. Uh -huh. He says, it's, let steadfastness have its full and effective work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Go to the next uh, thing in First Peter chapter 3. Oh, chapter one. Uh huh. And he says, uh huh. And rejoice. Uh huh. So that the tested genuineness of your faith. What he's trying to do is he's trying to prove the genuineness or the purity of your faith. Well, how are things? How is the purity and the genuineness of something proved? Uh-huh. How many of y'all got on gold in here this morning? How is gold, the genuineness and the purity of gold actually tested? It's only tested in the refiner's fire. So he had to take you through so he could validate, so that he could prove the genuineness of your faith. The genuineness is just to say that even in the midst of trial that you won't give up. In the midst of being tested that you won't turn your back on me. In the midst of being tried you won't in the midst of the hottest seasons and the darkest hell of your life I need to validate if you're able to handle the investment that I've placed on the inside of you. 
Mm -hmm. Because the truth of the matter is, we have this treasure that is in an earthen vessel. And the only way that the treasure that is in the earthen vessel can actually be exposed, the only way that it can actually be brought out, there has to be times of breaking before the pureness of the gift that's in the earthen vessel actually comes out. But not only is the pureness of the gift displayed at the place of breaking, but the value of the gift is displayed at the place of the breaking. Y'all remember in the Bible where the Bible talks about the lady with the alabaster box and she came in to anoint the feet of Jesus. She came in to anoint the feet of Jesus and when she came in to anoint the feet of Jesus, the value of what she had in the box was not exposed until the box was broken and the purpose for which she was there was actually executed. The value was not seen until the box was actually broken open. And when the box was broken open, there was others that tried to judge even the value of the box. They tried to judge even what she did with what was on the inside of the box. But the reality is, whatever God placed on the inside of you, the purpose that he placed on the inside of you, when he breaks it open and purpose begins to begin to be manifested and begin to be displayed, there are some that are not going to understand why you do what you do. But it's not their place to judge. It's not their place to judge. It's not their place to even ask you why you do what you do. Why are you giving God praise in the middle of everything that's going on around you? How is it that you can still give God? How is it that you can still go to church and lift up your hands and all this stuff is going on around you? How is it that you can be in the middle of storms all around you and you still got to praise? I still got to praise because my perspective of trials has been changed. Uh-huh. My perspective of testing has been changed. I now understand that God just doesn't test me to test me. But in the middle of my testing, God is trying to prove and to validate the value of the gift that he placed on the inside of me. And if I can let patience and testing have its perfect work. Yeah, if I can let God try me and test me at every level, if I can let him confirm and validate in me that I've graduated and I'm ready to be promoted, there's something that God will do great and mighty in my life. There's something that God will transform and that God will manifest in the middle of my life. But I got to be willing to go through the testing. I got to change my perspective and how I see what God is doing in my life because if I don't see if I don't change how I see what God is doing then I won't say what is right about what God is doing yeah because when we change if we allow God to change our perspective if he changes how we see it then he'll change what we say about it but he can't change what you say about it until he changes how you see it so if you keep seeing it the way that you see it and not through the eyes of God you continue to minimize or to devalue the process that God is trying to bring you through in your life. But God is trying to tell us on this morning, we got to change our perspective. We got to change the way that we look at trial. And you got to change not only the way you look at it, but you got to change what you say about it and then change the way that you react to it. Yeah, because if you don't change the way that you react to it, you'll never be able to change the outcome. Because what? We are products of what we say and products of what we do. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, because you can say it sometimes all you want to, but until you begin to put it into action, what does the Bible say? Faith without works is what is dead. So you can say all day that you trust God. You can say all day that you believe God. You can say all day that, God, I'm ready to be promoted. But God says, okay, now I'm going to bring this one last trial. What you going to do about this one? What color you going to put on this one, Sugar Avery? He said, uh-uh, I'm going to slide this in here and see what you do about that. God says, I need you to change your perspective. Because if you can change your perspective, I'm ready to promote you. And I'm ready to move you to this next place. Uh -huh. I'm going to testify and then I'm going to close. Uh, myself, I had to live through this whole process that God got me preaching about this morning. In 2008, in, in a matter of less than three months, I lost 70% of my income. 
In a matter of three months, I, I'm, I'm going to say that one more time so y'all get it, and I'm going to let that simmer in your spirit. In a matter of three months, I lost 70% of my income. Coming to church, serving in church, serving the leader, on time, wife pregnant, leading worship, all of that. After the 70% gone, I'm still tithing and giving on the 30. Matter, three months, I lost 70% of my income. Where I was doing well in corporate America, I found myself standing in an assistance line trying to get somebody to pay my gas bill. Found myself in a situation where I had to get that good old eat better today. Listen, I appreciate God. Because on the ninth of every month, they refreshed that joker with 465. I told the Lord, thank you. Yeah. Went in that line, shame as I wanted to be, and told them, swipe this here card. Right. <laughs> Faithful to God, doing everything that I lost my house, lost my car, wife sick. What are you doing? This makes absolutely no since all the Lord said was go where <laughs> just go all right pack up mm -hmm. pack up all my stuff because you know they get ready to put this padlock on this house so you got to get all your mess out and go went three hours up the road to carry North Carolina Lord put us in a situation where I found an apartment and I knew it was the leading of the Lord, because the Lord said, when I found the apartment, they said, listen, you ain't got to pay rent for two months. I said, word, I'm glad, because I ain't got the rent. <laughs> but look, I had to borrow this deposit. Okay, so y'all don't want to be real. I'm telling y'all about a real situation. Y'all don't feel, I'm, okay, I'm going to tell y'all about what I lived through. This is what I felt. Okay. okay. So we get into the apartment. This is July and August. August and September, we don't have to pay rent. Gave me a prorated rent for the month of July. I didn't have to pay rent for August and September. I go to a service the first Sunday in September. It is the Sunday before Labor Day. I'm standing in a church service, and the pastor at the end of his message asks, is there anybody in the room that is unemployed? I'm sitting there like, you think I'm going to raise my hand? You must be out your mind. Because, God, you already got me out here asking questions about what exactly you really doing, and now you're going to bring me in the midst of this church of a pastor that I know. I don't know none of them, but I know him, and he's going to ask, is there anybody unemployed? On Front Street, raise your hand. I said, okay, all right. So now he, but then the pastor, he ain't stopped there. He took it a step further. He said, all y'all to raise your hand. Do me a favor, come up here to the front. I said, wait a minute. So I'm already embarrassed because I'm in church. Now you're going to bring me to the front of the church. There's a few other people up there. He said, listen, everybody that's in this audience, get money out your pocket and put it in the hands of these people. They're standing up here at this altar. I said, oh, Lord, okay, this is what it's getting ready to be? So this is how you're going to do it. I'm gonna, this, this has come? Okay, so this, this can be about, about four, five hundred. This going to get me through. Forty-seven dollars. <laughs> What am I supposed to do with $47? What? Am I supposed to do with $47? Okay, I said, all right, all right, God, I'm out here. We out here. We believe in you. We trust in you. Uh huh. Next day was Monday, Labor Day. Tuesday, I get a call on the phone. And this lady says, hey, we want to bring you in for an interview. I said, first of all, who are you? Second of all, what job are you talking about? Because what you're talking about, I don't even remember applying for this job. She says, I've been looking for you for two months. My address on the resume that she got, that I still don't even know how she got, still said that I lived in Gastonia. She said, are you still in the Charlotte area? I said, no, I moved to Raleigh two months ago. I'm in your neck of the woods. She said, come in for the interview. Came in for the interview. Long story short, she interviewed me. She said, yeah, yeah you, you the one. Uh, when can you start? Uh -huh. 
I can start right now. But this is the thing, though. I'm mad and questioning God as the Father, what is it that you're doing? Why is it that you're doing it in this way? Not understanding and realizing that the skill set that I needed to balance my resume was the thing that she is hiring me to now do. This job now opens up the door and the opportunity for every job that I get going forward. Okay. So now I'm going to break it down into stuff that really matter to y'all. Because everybody want to know what the numbers look like. Here it go. Lost 70% of my income in three months. Move to carry. The Lord gives you all of that back plus 40%. Y'all, this math getting ready to get real good. So now, fast forward five years. Lord said, time to go. Move back home. I said, how that's going to work? Got to come back to Charlotte. Lord, I don't understand. Because now I know you're calling me to pastor. It's time to do something else. God said, go back to Charlotte. We move back to Charlotte. This is how crazy this is. The same job that he gave me where I was now making 40% more than what I lost at the 70% that I lost, he took me back to Charlotte, kept that same job, and I was working remotely. I ain't even have to go in the office. I'm getting that good money. But let me tell you how good God is. I applied for a contract at Wells Fargo because that was trying to get back in the bank and wanted to get that banking technology money. That wasn't that, that good money. So then what he did, God set it up like this. I kept my old job. All of my customers in my old job were either in China or in Ireland, on the other side of the world. So all of my meetings for those customers were between 6 a.m. and 11 a.m. every day. I apply for the contract at Wells Fargo, the guy gives me the job, and I'm supporting a unit that now sits on the West Coast. So I don't have to start working with my Wells Fargo customer till somewhere between 11 and 11.30. So what you do, God, you gave me the ability to do both of these jobs at the very same time. Let's do the math. Lost 70%, gave me 70% back, plus 40%. Now I got the 70% plus 40%, and you gave me another job. I'm now at about 175% of what I lost. Let me tell you how good God is. Fast forward five more years. The Lord tells me or brings me into an opportunity where I'm on, on LinkedIn one day and a guy posts a job and he said, man, I'm posting this position. I want somebody to come do it. And I said, mm, it looks nice. I might be interested in a change. I replied to the post and said that. Fast forward two months later, I get a call from a recruiter. I never applied for the job. I get a call from a recruiter and says, we're interviewing for this job. And the manager said that your resume was supposed to be in the stack, but it ain't here. Wait a minute. He says, can you go apply for this job? The job ain't even posted no more. Y'all done took the job down. He said, wait one minute. Go apply for the job. He reposted the job just so I could apply for it. Interview for the job, got the job, ready to start, and I get a call from the same recruiter. And he says, wait a minute. I need you to go back out here and apply for this job. I said, I just, wait, what are you talking about? I already got the job. Why are you telling me to go back out here and apply for the job? He said, I need you to go out here and apply for this job because the money that you asked for, we can't give you in the job that you interviewed for. We got to create a whole nother role and a whole nother position to pay you what you asked for. But wait a minute. I was mad at asking God why. I was frustrated and asking God why. When I tell you, the way I have to tell that part of the testimony is that he added a salary to my salary. (laughs) 
But it was only because in the process of my testing, I let patience have his perfect work so that I would be perfect and entire lacking go to that last scripture real quick 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6 oh Lord and after you have suffered a little while the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory and Jesus Christ will himself restore confirm strengthen and establish you what God is trying to tell us this morning is that if you can just trust me through the middle of the process if you can just trust me and count it all joy in the midst of your trials I'm trying to get you to a place where I can establish you I'm trying to get you to a place where I can confirm you what I'm trying to get you to a place I'm going to bring you to a place where I will restore everything that the canker worm and the palmer worm ate I restore everything that every enemy, every demon, and every devil tried to steal. I restore everything. He said, and I will establish you. He says, I'll make sure that your footing is now sure. Yeah, I'll make sure that this time when you get ready to step that your foot won't slip. He said, I'll make sure that this time as you get ready to move, that you can move with faith and assurance uh, that the God of all gods has got your back. I'll make your feet sure that this time when you step in faith, uh, you'll know and you believe uh, without a shadow of a doubt uh, that God is with me uh, and God is right in the middle of my trial. That God is in the middle of my test. Uh, and if I can just trust God right through here, that God is able to make all grace abound towards us, towards every good work. If we can just trust God through here, God is able to cause our yesterday to be a, a promise in our mind. God is able to cause our yesterday to be a faint memory in our mind. And he'll give us visions for our tomorrow. God is saying this morning, morning if you can just trust me for the next season if you can change your perspective uh, of the trial that you're in uh, I want to show you uh, something that you've never seen before but I need you to trust me uh, right where you are I need you to trust me uh, in the middle of your test uh, I need you to trust me uh, in the middle of your trial because the trying uh, of your faith uh, it's going to work patience. Let patience uh, have its perfect work uh, so that you can be perfect uh, and complete uh, and lacking nothing. God is trying to get us to a point uh, where we lack uh, nothing. Uh, for he says in his word that any good thing uh, I will not withhold uh, from you uh, any good thing uh, if you ask me for it me being a father that knows how to get good gifts will I not give it to you if you can just ask uh, and believe in faith uh, trust me in the middle of a trial God says I'm going uh, to bring you to the point where you're perfect uh, entire lacking nothing he's gonna bring you to the point where there's nothing broken and there's nothing missing nothing broken and nothing missing nothing incomplete and nothing not finished by the God that when I begin a work I'm the same God that is able to finish the work come on somebody where are my Bible scholars he that began a good 
power in you. He's faithful to complete the work. But not only will he complete the work, but in completing the work, he's going to establish you. He's going to establish you. He's going to establish you. He's going to make you like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. You will not be moved. He's trying to make you like the palm tree. Y'all remember the palm tree? The palm tree is that tree down in Florida that when the hurricanes come and the winds blow, the tree bends, but it does not break. The tree bends, but it does not break. It can only do it because the tree has been established and it's been established through your trial. I came to tell somebody, you've been trying to make sense of the matter, but I came to tell you, it's the laws, it's the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in his eyes. You gotta change your perspective and you gotta tell your trial, Trial, I know who sent you. Trial, I know who sent you. And if the Lord sent it, he's got purpose in it. If the Lord sent it, it ain't over until I win. Why do you say that, preacher? Well, I heard Paul say, all things work together for the good of them that love the law and are called according to his purpose. I may not understand it, but there's one thing that I know that I'm called according to his purpose. It may not feel good, but there's one thing that I know that I'm called according to his purpose. It may not look good, but one thing that I know is that I'm called according to his purpose. And if I'm called, it's working for my good. It's working for my benefit. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, they're not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. I don't care where you are and what you're going through. I came to tell you this morning, there we are, be glory after this. There we are, be power after this. There we are, be victory after this. After you suffer a little while, he's going to establish you. He's going to restore you. He's going to bring back everything that you lost. Somebody just begin to give God praise because I'm seeing my trials differently. I'm seeing my test in a different light. I'm seeing what I'm going through through the eyes of God. And I know, I know, tell your neighbor, say neighbor, I know, come on, get your preaching voice and tell your neighbor, I, I, I know that it's going to get better. I know that better days are on the way. I know that where I am is a temporary inconvenience on my way to permanent improvement. I know that we've been made, we've been made, we've been made, we've been made, endure for a night, but yeah, it comes in the morning, yeah, it comes in the morning, slap your neighbor and tell your neighbor, good morning, my joy is here, good morning, my peace is here. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. My change, my change has come. 
My change has come. My change has come. My change has come. Hey. Hey. My change has come. It's all making sense now. I was mad and I was arguing with God. But God says, everything that I took you through, put that, that verse up there again. The last one, 1 Peter chapter 10. Chapter 5, verse 10. He says that he will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. But it's only after you've suffered a little while. Just a little while. Hey, just a little while. I need somebody to know that this morning the Lord says you're at the end of your little while. And this is a season that I myself am going to restore, to confirm, strengthen, and establish you. What I'm going to do for you in this season is going to be undeniable. In other seasons, somebody else may have been able to take the credit. But God says, what I'm going to do in this season is going to be undeniable. The only thing that anybody's going to be able to say is only the Lord, only God. That's how God's going to set it up for you in this season. That they're going to be able to pass by there because only God did this. Because I saw what you went through. And to now see your victory, only God could have done this. To see the way that God restores and replenishes and gives you back. Not just what you had, but that and more. He said, it ain't just enough to restore what was lost. He said, I got to strengthen and establish you as well. I got to confirm. I got to confirm. Yeah, you want crazy. Yeah, I got to confirm to all of the naysayers that you hadn't lost your mind. I got to confirm to all of the Negroes that said that it wouldn't happen, that it would. I had to, I had to stretch that out and make sure I said what I was supposed to say. Because, you know, sometimes I get a little hood and I say what I want to say, not what I'm supposed to say. God says, this is the season. That after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you, he's going to restore. He's going to confirm. He's going to strengthen and establish you. Come on, lift your hands in the presence of the Lord. Father, today we thank you, God, for making sense of some of the nonsense that has been in our lives. Thank you, Father, for bringing clarity, Father, to some of the noise that has been combating us on every side. Thank you, Father, for giving me today the shot of faith that I needed to continue to press and not give up in the middle of my suffering. Because, God, you've given me the assurance that after I've suffered a little while that father you are going to restore you are going to confirm you're going to strengthen and establish me so father I just say yes to the balance of what it is that you're doing in my life father I won't throw my hands up and give up but I will throw my hands up and surrender 
say, whatever it is, God, that you require and demand of me in this moment, Father, my answer is yes. This next place that you're calling me to, Father, my answer is yes. Whatever it requires of me in this next season, my answer is yes. Because if I can endure the suffering, God, greater is on the other side of my pain. God, if I can endure the suffering, I can reap the inheritance that it won't always be like this. But Father, you will perfect everything that concerns me. And sooner and not later, God, you're going to turn it all in my favor. Father, you're turning our situations today. Come on, if you believe that this morning, come on, just worship God in this moment. Come on, just lift your hands and begin to thank him. Begin to tell him, God, I changed my perspective about my suffering. God, I see my suffering through your eyes in this moment. God, and I believe you. I trust you that, God, whatever it is that you're taking me through in this moment, if you brought me to it, God, there's purpose in it. So, Father, whatever the purpose is that I'm supposed to get in this moment, in the middle of this trial, God calls me to graduate and pass every level of testing. God, take me from development to situational to broad fix so that I can stand in the real life production of what it is that you desire to do in my life. God, I'm open to however it is, God, that you desire to mature me, to grow me, and to birth out of me everything that you've placed in me. Father, my answer is yesterday. Though it is painful, my answer is yesterday. Though I don't understand it, Father, I throw my need for an explanation out the window, and I say yes. Thank you for making it make sense. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. And we tell God, thank you. Now, come on, if you agree with that prayer, come on, put your hands together. Come on, open your mouth and thank God for the word today. For he sent his word to heal us. Come on, is there anybody that appreciates the word today? Hallelujah.